Well, welcome to the afternoon session here at uh, Dawn or Doom, our day number two. Uh, if everybody could um, come on in and find an open seat. Uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Haley Oliver. Haley Oliver is an associate professor of food science in the College of Agriculture here at Purdue University. Dr. Oliver joined Purdue University in 2010 after completing her PhD and postdoc training at Cornell. Her research team focuses on prevention of foodborne disease, uh, for example, listeriosis and salmonellosis in humans. She is internationally recognized as a leading expert in retail food safety and has been working to improve food safety and security in Afghanistan since 2012. Uh, Dr. Oliver is the United States Department of Agriculture, Ex Agriculture Excellence in Teaching Award winner, uh, a member of the Purdue Teaching Academy, and a recent recipient of the Larry Bouchot Young Researcher Award from the International Association of Food Protection. Uh, today she will present a talk titled, You Think You Know What Food Causes Your Diarrhea. See, I got to say it too. <laughs> See, uh, it's a good day, right? <laughs> Right, Can you spell it? it? Can you spell it without yeah. looking? D I A R H. No. no. <laughs> okay. Not even close. Not even close. Uh, uh, detangling food safety and food quality. So now, uh, please silence your electronic devices. But of course, this is Zoner Doom, so do not put them away. Uh, we'd love to see you tweeting to the hashtag, uh, hashtag Donor Doom, and to the hashtag, hashtag. Uh, right posting though. to Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, uh, whatever social media you prefer. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Oliver. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you'll, I guess, tolerate me for the next couple of minutes. I'm going to ask you some intense questions. Number one, oh, this is counterintuitive. Got to push it the other way. Who's had diarrhea? Own it. <laughs> I, I actually want you to stand up. Oh. Yeah. Stand up if you've had it. Yeah. Those of you who are sitting are lying. So take a, <laughs> take a look around at who those people are. They're suspicious. They can't be trusted. There's the doom part. Check. We did doom. Right? You probably had it more than once. <laughs> I have. I'm, you'll notice I'm standing. <laughs> There's no reason for me to sit down. Uh, but most of it's self-inflicted and educated risk. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that uh, here this afternoon. So <laughs> yes, you can have this slide if you ever need it for a talk. <laughs> I haven't, haven't patented it or anything. How much food do you throw away because you think it's bad? Yeah? How many pounds do you think? I, there's data out there that say how much. And I'm, and at least somebody on the North American content throws away. How much do you think it is? Two pounds a week. Two pounds a week? Eh. 30%. About 30% of what we buy, we throw away. It turns out to be between 95 and 115 kilograms. So if you multiply that times 2.2, that's about how much food we each throw away each year. So if we get into this idea of food security, food quality, and food safety, they're all tangled together in this nasty mess. And most of it is driven by consumer choices, at least in this, on, this continent, on this particular continent. And I love this quote from the FAO. So this is a document that came out in 2001, but I, I underlined my favorite words. You know, it's a combination of our careless attitude, so I'm here to do a little sh you know, public shaming, right? And, and those consumers that can afford to waste food. Now granted, that isn't everyone in the United States, for example, but it's certainly, I know I'm guilty of this particular. I guess, offense, and I can do better here. But we're here to talk about, first of all, food safety, then food quality, how they're mixed together and really not mixed together, and how they tie into food security. So food safety, at least in my role or my job, is to make food safer, right? And that's making sure that it's free of chemical, biological, and physical hazards. So I'm gonna focus, I, I'm biased, I'm a microbiologist, so I'm gonna focus on the bacteria. But there's certainly things like chemi chemicals, we know lead, for example, finds its way into food systems, and then physical hazards, so rocks. <laughs> Something as simple as rocks or bone shards, um, anything that can break your teeth or cause gastric puncture. So no good news there, right? Well, food quality is very different, actually. 
And that's really focusing on foods that are desired. What is it that is desirable about foods to eat? So their organoleptic properties, their sight, their smell, their taste. Now, does anybody in this room like Lemberger cheese? Does anybody know what Lemberger is? It smells, it tastes like feet. I think it tastes like feet have to taste. Like if you could taste feet, I, I think that's it. Right? Do you know why it smells Butyric like that? Acid. Say that? Butyric acid. Butyric acid. And do you know where those microorganisms come from? Basically, <laughs> people's hands, because it's a hand-wiped cheese, right? So it's the human element of that cheese that makes it so wonderful, right? So I, we might have a disagreement on Lemberger if there is somebody that actually likes that nasty product. You might find its quality. <laughs> I don't have an opinion on that, obviously. Um, <laughs> but somebody might really enjoy that, and they would find that very high quality. I, on the other hand, find it completely vile and therefore low quality. But it doesn't mean that it's unsafe. It doesn't actually contain, usually in most situations, any bacterium that would cause any type of foodborne disease. So defining food quality, you know, most consumers have, we live by this date stamp that's on a lot of our food products. So the sell-by date, the expiration date, and really we abuse that like a deadline, like the world comes to an end tomorrow if you happen to actually avoid that deadline or if you happen to drink your milk one day later. Does anybody know what that number actually means? Like when, what the date is on a gallon of milk? Does it expire? No, it's a best by date, right? It's a used by date. It's when quality, we expect quality to begin to deteriorate after that time period. Who decides on that date? Is it the government? No, it's actually the milk producer. So there's some questions around that maybe, right? But we expect it to last 14 to 21 days and nothing magical happens on day 15 or day 22. You will start to have higher microbial counts over time, but they're microbes that will cause it to spoil. And the organisms that cause spoilage do not cause disease. Take that message with you, please. That's one of our major takeaways today. So the types of hazards in food, we talked about chemicals. That could be everything from sanitizers, pesticides. So pesticide is actually a very broad category. It could be used to prevent insects, um, uh, insect damage on crops. Um, it could be something that we use as sanitizers to actually eliminate microbes from surfaces. If used in excess, they can become a chemical hazard. Physical, I've kind of already talked about. And then biological, bacteria, viruses, and parasites. And that's really what I want to focus on today. And I have this lovely lineup of microbes to support my cause here today. Oh, look at all those pictures that didn't show up. That's nice. Well, that's all right. We get the big, we'll, we'll tackle it anyway. So when we look at the types of microorganisms that are in food, we have yeast, bacteria, viruses, molds, <laughs> and bacteriophage. I see my, my parasites are missing. Anybody, if you've ever seen a picture of a parasite, they basically look like an alien, right? Does that help you picture that thing? Oh, that's hard. Now I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have staff on your hands? 25% <laughs> of you are carriers of staff aureus. Just saying. Wash your hands, don't eat poop. Those are the rules of food safety anyway. <laughs> we'll see what, how good the AV guys do. Right? So we have these six categories of organisms that we find in foods. And they fall into categories. So if we look at yeast, there are some, certainly, the, certainly that we use for, yeast produ for food production. I know I'm guilty of eating a lot of yeast-involved products. Bread, beer, beer <laughs> wine. Right. If you ever see me at the grocery store, I have a pretty unique lineup of things. It's usually pickles, a box of wine, because that's fancy, <laughs> yogurt. It's basically anything fermented. And it's, it's I guess I, that's just always supporting my love for microbes. Um, but we know that some of them, although they're, it's really quite rare, some of the yeast can actually be pathogenic. Bacteria, some we use in food production. We've talked a little bit about Lemberger cheese already. Mm, yay. <laughs> but anybody like sour beers? Uh, there's only a few of us, but that's good. There's more for the rest of us, right? So that, there's some bacteria involved in that process. And we also know that bacteria can spoil foods. But again, the bacteria that cause disease don't destroy the quality of your food. So when you take a look in your refrigerator drawer, which I did this morning because I needed some new pictures to add to my phone bank of, my phone is terrible. You should see what's on it. It's, it's embarrassing. It's like, I was just saying to Bar my friend Barb here, it's 90% my dogs, 
and 7% charcuterie boards <laughs> and 3% oysters. Like that's all it's on. So I needed some spoilage pictures. So all, I was gonna go to the grocery store, but I thought, no, I mean, if I just open the fridge, <laughs> I'll find some treats or look on the counter in the dead fruit bowl. I have this bowl on my counter. It's where fruit go to die. I buy them, I put them in there and I watch their death. It's true. <laughs> because I'm too busy eating pickles and drinking wine, and I don't have time for those fruit. <laughs> they get in the way of my lifestyle. So, <laughs> so I had some pictures at home. I didn't have to go anywhere. So all the pictures that I show you today are actually off my phone, and I've got a lot of pictures, so I better get to them. So the estimates of foodborne disease in the United States, we tracked 31 known pathogens, and we estimate that those ca cause about 9.4 million episodes of foodborne disease. So. Point number one, why, if you didn't stand up, I'm starting to break out the data why we know you're lying, okay? It's the beginning of the end for you. So 9.4 million episodes of, of disease, we know that that lands about 56,000 people in the hospital and about 1,500 of those people die. The total cost of the burden of foodborne illness in the United States is estimated to be 55 billion. I think that's even more than maybe Donald Trump made. Maybe, we don't know. But anyway, it's a lot of money, right? It's a huge burden to the economy. 55% of illnesses are caused by norovirus, which is represented, I think, as this delight right here. I'm not sure how terribly accurate this is. Oh no, that's the common cold. That guy doesn't count. <laughs> He's out. All right, <laughs> they don't look any, I'm not sure what the difference between blue and gray is. You have the same general structure here. Who's had norovirus? Do you know? Why? How do you know? You have to tell the world. A, I got it on a Disney cruise. See? Yeah. <laughs> but they treated me like a princess because I had it and I wasn't allowed to leave the room. It, mine was not that cute. It wasn't, but you no. can have that one because it is cuter. <laughs> yeah, you won't find me on a cruise. Mm. One, I guess I'm cheap because <laughs> I spent it all on box wine. I don't know. But if I'm going to take that one week off this year, I'm probably not going to go put myself on a floating island with a bunch of people that are puking and have diarrhea. <laughs> I can do that at home <laughs> if I eat enough oysters, right? So norovirus is the leading cause of foodborne illness in the United States, followed by salmonella, so salmonellosis being the disease, then clostridium perfringens. Good luck ever finding that organism. It just causes disease, and it comes and goes, and we live with it. And then campylobacter. You know, two of those, uh, salmonella and campylobacter, largely associated with chicken, although it, we see many instances of it outside of poultry now, but that's the leading association of those. When it comes to death, if you're going to die from a foodborne illness, it's going to be from salmonella, then toxoplasma gondii, which nobody's ever heard of, and then listeria monocytogenes. So toxoplasma gondii is a parasite, and if you've ever heard of crazy cat lady syndrome, um, it's actually believed to be one of the drivers of that disease. It's a socioeconomic disease why pregnant women are not supposed to handle cat feces. All right, we said feces, that's pretty good. That's a, like an upgrade on diarrhea, right? <laughs> pretty good. All right, so if we break it down, total number of cases, Campylobacter causes 1.3 million cases of disease each year. Now, these are estimates because of the, those of you who have had a foodborne disease, who actually went to the hospital or actually went to the doctor? Yeah, there you go. You didn't contribute to our statistics very well, did you? Right? But no, as we ride it out, right? You're like, all right, day one, not good. Day two, you're like, all right, I think we're coming up. I can see the light. I can leave the house for three minutes instead of one. We usually don't report these things because we often recover. But if you happen to be in the immunocompromised population of young, old, um, pregnant, or otherwise immunocompromised through something like chemotherapy, the likelihood of death increases significantly, and the severity of the disease obviously does as well. My lab group studies salmonella, and we also study listeria monocytogenes. If you look at listeria, now this isn't, this isn't a very large burden of disease in the United States, but what have the recalls been lately in the news? Listeria, and why this continues to be a problem is because if you look at the case fatality rate, it's very different from other organisms like salmonellosis or gastroenteritis from E. coli. It targets, you know, disease listeriosis only happens in extraordinarily immunocompromised populations, which means the propensity for death is already higher. Who's responsible for this? Well, <laughs> not you guys apparently, right? We do a lot of work um, in the food industry from primary production at the farm, through manufacturing or processing, through distribution and then to retail to do our best to control foodborne illness. And ultimately, um, 
really the consumer is the last to be blamed. And you'll see it on the news, you see it through lawsuits, et cetera, that you know, we expect as American consumers that our food to, to be perfectly safe. It's an expectation, you go to the grocery store, you're going to buy lettuce, and you don't go in there saying, I have a 1% chance of getting diarrhea from this. You know, no, but not too many people move through the world that way. I do, because I think it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> and again, you know, 3% of my phone is pictures of oysters, so I obviously consume those things. And the USDA's current version of the risk assessment says that for every oyster you eat, you should get sick. So it's educated risk. So every time I eat an oyster, it's like roulette, where you always win. You could always get sick, I guess, is the goal. So <laughs> this is going to be a trip through my iPhone here for the next few minutes as we look at the foods that um, will be familiar to some of my friends here in the room uh, through some of our functions that we've had. Um, oh, no. We may not have any pictures. That could make for a really bummer of a day. Sorry about that. No, they're just not projecting through the actual screen. Audiovisual folks, can you help me? Yeah, I can see them here. No. I know I have to ad lib diarrhea, right? How does one do that? This one's funny. <laughs> this one is called diarrhea, yet it's supposed to be an organism. I don't view diarrhea as an organism myself, but I think it's pretty funny to picture of diarrhea. But it has eyes. <laughs> Should diarrhea have eyes? I don't know. Bloody diarrhea? It's real, right? So I had salmonellosis once. I'm pretty sure I did it to myself in a laboratory accident as an undergraduate. Whoops. But it, it was uh, my A or B for my diagnostic class was on the line. And I, I had an inconclusive biochemical test for <laughs> an organism that turned out to be salmonella. <laughs> and a few days later, I wasn't feeling very well. I kind of couldn't get off the couch because my intestines, I'm sure, were like tying themselves in knots to stop the excruciating pain. And I went to you know the equivalent of student health at the time. Is it coming back? Damn, I worked really hard on that too. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. cool. All right, we got solutions to problems here. <laughs> so I, I they, the student health group, they're like, ah, oh, it's a virus. And what do you do for a virus? Nothing. Don't take antibiotics unless you want to make your life worse, right? Strip off some normal flora, let the outgrowth of, I don't know, Clostridium difficile take over, and then you do have real problems. Well, so I waited around a little bit longer, and then things did start to bleed. And I tell you what, that is a terrifying thing. And, you know, as a microbiologist, you know, <laughs> you're kind of fascinated and terrified at the same time. Because, one, you probably know you did it to yourself. At least you hope you did that nobody else has this terrible disease. So, yeah, finally... Uh, returned to the doctor and said, you know, viruses don't make you bleed, right? So it's a severe infection and easily managed with antibiotics, but we choose those wisely. Yeah. Right yeah. We're at about 25%, it looks like. Uh, oh. yeah, sorry. Is that a really big file? It's I massive. Maybe the images don't want to load quickly. It's running locally on the Mac. All right, well, if we look at that picture right there, that's, oh, well, this will be fun. All right, well, looking at this picture right here, what do we have going on? It's my celery and my grapes on my counter. Like I said, these are all my pictures, all my guilt. What's going on here? What's, what's wrong with this celery? It keeps the rinse. It keeps the rinse. You don't want to eat soup in my house. <laughs> It'll polish your teeth at the same time, <laughs> right? All right, anything else wrong with that celery? It's <laughs> you making fun of my celery? <laughs> it does look kind of sad. I've used part of it. It's been hanging out in the not very crispy crisper in the bottom of my fridge for a little bit long. Do, do we know if it has any pathogens on it? No, we don't. We don't know anything about that. I highly doubt it does. If it did, it might have Listeria monocytogenes on it. 
It might also have Clostridium perfringens. It might have Clostridium botulinum spores on it. Really about anything could be on it, but I don't know because I haven't tested it and I haven't done a self-test on just that celery lately. Hey, what about the grapes? What's wrong with my, <laughs> my grapes? I mean, not, not a thing. They're sad as well. I basically have a lot of sad produce. I tell you, it comes to my house to die. It's either in the fridge death or in the bowl death. Right? <laughs> these were not in the bowl. All right, what do we know about these? What's probably ending the shelf life of these grapes? What causes them to die? Do you see mold on your grapes? Oh gosh, absolutely, right? Right at the stem juncture, right? That's actually like a wound on a grape. As soon as you pull a grape off or if it falls off of the actual stem, you've created this awesome open wound on your grape. So that allows any of the mold spores that were on the outside to find their way in and begin the extreme degradation of your grape. It's probably not producing a toxin. So you could eat that moldy grape. It's low quality. If you've ever had ice wine, true ice wine? Yeah, botrytis. So we actually drive the production of ice wine with mold. And it looks about like my grapes, only worse. I don't think these are, I don't think I have enough for ice wine though. I'd have to throw them in the freezer. Are we getting clothes? Yeah. We have no hope? We may, we may still. Do you, are, they, are the images in a folder somewhere? No, they're no, the they're just living in PowerPoint. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, anyway. While we work on that, anybody have any questions so far? Better take this with me. Yes, sir. Can you tell us a little bit more about your oysters? Are they, when you consume them, do you cook them first or do you oh. like, them, like them in their uh, <laughs> native state? So he wants to know, okay. He wants to know how I eat my oysters. Oh, I eat oysters every direction. I do prefer them raw. Again, that's educated risk. According to the risk assessment, you eat an oyster, you're gonna go down. And you do, <laughs> or at least if you don't wanna go to work, here's a solution to your problem. <laughs> go eat some oysters, <laughs> right? The probability of disease is actually quite high. Yes, I enjoy them. Um, I do add uh, mignonette, but that's because I just like the acid with it. Does it knock down the Vibrio perihemolyticus a little bit? Probably not enough to actually prevent disease. Uh, there's been some transmission of cholera through them because cholera is mainly a waterborne disease. Luckily, it's not something we interface with a lot here in the United States. Um, we only have 50 or so cases of cholera each year, and usually it's from travel abroad. Not a, not a pleasant thing. So yes, I take the risk. Do I like them in soup, and do I like them Rockefeller? You bet. Other questions? Yes, sir. That's why you do oyster shooters, because they're <laughs> That's, that's hard on Monday morning. <laughs> My question is that most of the recalls we've heard lately are always meat-based, and we've heard some flour-based recalls. Yeah. So those are the two common ones. Are, have there been, when was the last large canned product recall? I mean, I, I have to admit, I eat canned stuff that's two and three years old. Mm -hmm. And as long as the can isn't bulging, I've, you know, I've never once, it's never caused me any trouble. So right. has there ever been a canned-based recall? So, the, so that's a good question. If canned recalls actually happen, really the leading cause of recalls in the United States right now is that because they weren't labeled properly, that there's a label violation or a known allergen that is in the product that wasn't identified. So you might see it because of that. Um, we have learned how to process foods that are pH 4.6 and less. Um, and that we put into can, which actually allows for the outgrowth of Clostridium botulinum spores and then botulinum toxin production. There hasn't been one in a long time. And it's about the same level of disease as cholera in the United States. About 50 people, um, or max, get... Um, yeah, it's back. 50 people or so actually end up with disease. It's usually home canning <laughs> disasters. We're trying to put... Pro when we cook green beans for long-term preservation, either at home or in companies, we're trying to achieve what we call a 12D process, we're trying to kill 10 to the 12 Clostridium botulinum spores. That number is so outrageous and impractical in nature that that's our fail safe in making food safe. And so time and temperature is, is easily calculated to kill that many organisms, so it's not really a problem in the US. If you, if you wanted to get Clostridium botulinum, like if, if you had some desire to experience this disease, which I would not suggest, you have a 50% chance of living. 
right? Because your diaphragm quits, so you suffocate. It's not a good way to go. Um, fermented beaver tail and fish heads is actually a problem. In Canada, yeah, right? Yeah, don't eat fermented beaver tail. Get it from a reputable source. <laughs> I mean, that's all I can say for you. Yeah, it's back. I wonder what happened to that slide. This slide makes me laugh. This is CDC's attempt at being funny or direct. I'm not sure which. But this is directly from their website, and they're using emojis to explain foodborne illness. <laughs> Campylobacterosis, we have made no progress. <laughs> 0157 E. coli, we have because of regulations around ground beef. As you mentioned, we've had quite a few recalls in meat. Listeria, we're flatlining. We have not had any change. Same with salmonellosis. Vibriosis, so our oysters, we have seen an increase. I suspect this is because we're looking more for those particular foodborne illnesses. And Yersinia and her colitica, again, an organism you'd never probably go to the doctor for. We've seen improvements in the detection of that organism. All right, all right, here we go. Here's Haley's pictures. What's wrong with this situation? What's on this side? Raw and cooked. Raw, cooked. It says it's ready to cook. This, this is cooked. Yeah. We know that's cooked. And you may take that home and you may or may not heat it, right? Because cold crab is good too. I mean, crab anyway is good. Unless it's next to raw shrimp. This is here in town, by the way. Yeah. All right. Salad from France. Oh, you know what I didn't show you? The picture that didn't load. This is important. This is from dinner last night at oh. the president's house. <laughs> you were there. <laughs> there were some challenges is that why here. You didn't I ate, I have a picture that proves I ate this. It's at the end. You ruined my closer. No, I'm just kidding. So this was a corn salad, some cilantro, and these were grilled shrimp in kind of a teriyaki sauce. Not to out the entire staff of at the president's house, but everything they served was room temperature, which I would have preferred they were hot or cold. You have to choose. You can't ride it in the middle. That's... <laughs> while nobody's gonna you know you're not gonna burn yourself um, this is when, when you start storing foods at room temperatures where you see the outgrowth of most pathogens they love to live at room temperature just like we do so I'm not dead yet I made it I don't expect there to be any problems actually I was just using it as a pretty gritty example and I like that you know mm -hmm. uh -huh. I don't own that plate <laughs> that's terrible this is when I get fired <laughs> that's okay though What's wrong with this salad? Anything? The meat? What is that meat? Oh, anchovies. It's heavenly. Right, so that's a canned product. So that's pretty safe. What else? What's the least safe thing on this plate? No, th these are hard boiled. So, oh, oh, go back, go back. So these are hard boiled, so probably not. So you said the tomatoes. Yeah, I said the tomatoes or the lettuce are the scariest thing on this plate. Right? But man, does this look healthy and it looks high quality. Right? You're going to power this thing down without worrying a thing about it. This was in France, so it was taking a risk. I just wanted to show you this picture because it makes me laugh every time. Crunchy, creamy. This is from Afghanistan. The debate rages on of which is better. <laughs> right? I've come to sit in the middle. Like I, I've found peace with the middle. But what do we know about peanut butter? It's great. Does it kill people? Yeah. Every once in a while. Who killed people? Mm -hmm. Hmm? It was a pe well, Peter Peter Pan had a product. What it, uh, which is it was aflatoxin too. What about Peanut Butter Corporation of America? Do you remember that hot mess? Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 fifteen hundred products had salmonella in them. No big deal. Yeah, it was bird droppings. It was kind of condensate over, run over bird droppings onto peanut butter. You think that's pretty preventable. <laughs> it should be. But, you know, it was a really interesting case, you know, because there was some denial that it was happening or tested away. If you find a positive, if you test foods and you find salmonella, one thing you don't do ethically as a food company is say, let's test again. Right? Because if you test again, what are you likely to find? Nothing. Good. <laughs> Green light. Let's ship it. And that's what happened. And there's some certain challenging ethics behind that. Oh. <laughs> that's 
Monty. <laughs> I like making fun of myself because that's, I think Barb took that picture. Yeah. I love oysters, and we've talked about there are certain challenges here. And I shucked these at home, so these had some physical hazards in them. I had shell all over the place. So I really, I got to up my game. So I prefer to let others do it, and obviously I'm very excited about it. You can't see my wine, though. That's what I'm probably really looking at. Um, what about here? This is an Indiana classic. I'd never seen this until I moved to Indiana. <laughs> what is this? That's a pork tenderloin. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you where it's at, but I bet if you look closely, you can figure it out. <laughs> Anything wrong with my pork tenderloin? It's probably a pretty safe product. It's just been <laughs> deep fried, <laughs> right? It's very thin, so we're going to get great heat transfer. So again, what's the riskiest thing on this plate? Well, the bun well, yeah, doesn't really support the growth of much. If it actually had some produce on it, because this is just a tenderloin sandwich, we don't want to adulterate it with produce. <laughs> it's not much that's too dangerous here, honestly, other than the fact that these are very heavily handled. And I already blamed our poor soul in the back of being a Staph aureus carrier, hopefully not a MRSA carrier. <laughs> but you know, these have been all touched, hopefully with gloves or tongs. But I, was, I can assure you, I was at a restaurant uh, last Friday, for the first time, I really thought about calling the health department. And I've never done that, but I was getting close. They had a sink full of chopped lettuce, which I don't know if it was going into further processing or not. I hope it was going to be cooked to death, but it was lettuce, like iceberg lettuce. I doubt it. And then the individual was handling noodles with his bare hands. So again, an opportunity. Oh, here's my cheese board. One of many, right? Anything wrong with this situation? We have honey, nuts, mustard, some dried fruit, probably a big pile of butter. That's what I think that was. Some fermented or pickled vegetables, breads, cheeses, and the highlight of the show. What's the highest risk thing on the plate? The meat. Probably, probably the meat in this instance. We're worried about Listeria monocytogenes here, right? So if anyone's pregnant or otherwise immunocompromised, this is a challenging product. These cheeses are okay because they're a low moisture cheese. If it was mozzarella or, or fresh mozzarella in particular, that's a bigger challenge because it's higher water content and the higher the water content, the more likely a bacteria that could cause disease could actually grow. Right? What is this? That's lettuce. That's what your mixed greens actually look like, right? Before they're shaved off with what looks like a lawnmower, right? So these are actually grown in the mix in the fields in California. It's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen, actually. What do you notice about this situation? Dirt. There's dirt. <laughs> yep, dirt. There might be some birds. Doesn't look like it today. Looks like, I don't know, the cats ate all the birds or something, right? And what do you see in the background? Um. More dirt in the air, probably, because this is the Salinas Valley. So that if anybody's ever been there to Salinas, and the wind is blowing. If you look at the trees, they're on a constant lean. Like they grow that way because the wind blows so much. So you're picking up dirt. Uh, pretty much every one of our foodborne pathogens finds its way to the dirt or is from the dirt. So do we expect lettuce to be free of pathogens? Probably not. It's really not a realistic goal at the end of the day. Does this look absolutely wonderful? Yes, it's the most beautiful thing in the world to see in the field, actually. And then again, harvest. If you're buying romaine hearts, for example, those are actually bagged right in the field. You know, it's a process they're sprayed off with a bleach water and bagged directly in the field. There's really not a treatment you can do to that product without cooking it that actually would kill microbes that are there. So prevention is absolutely key. <laughs> and then there's this kind of lettuce, right? Do you remember seeing this locally? It was probably about January. Yeah. All the lettuce went away. How come it went away? Listeria. Where's Listeria? Somebody said Listeria. I think it was this Listeria. Yeah, somebody said Listeria. You need a little Listeria. You need the Listeria. Everybody needs a little Listeria in their life. <laughs> yeah, I've been exposed to it for about 12 years now. I'm feeling pretty immune. But yeah, this was a massive recall in the U.S. It was from a contamination event. It's very public. It was Dole Foods, Listeria monocytogenes contamination. It was actually linked to the same outbreak that Canada identified before we did. That's not good, right? We don't want Canada beating us. 
that's not that's not good news. But yeah, it's a it's a plant that's actually in Ohio and it's in the middle of our distribution area. So all of a sudden, no leafy greens for you. You can have some kale. There's some kale that's left. Who's excited about kale? Ah, it's okay. Arugula is better in my opinion. Oh, we've seen that. Set. Oh yes, if you can identify this, except for the people who know, because I know there's people in this room that know what this is. What is that meat? <coughs> hmm? It's not too, who said tongue? His tongue. I love beef tongue. Gosh, lengua tacos. Whew. You gotta come eat with me more often. We can show you where all the good food is in town. Yeah, that is beef tongue. How do you cook beef tongue? Maybe you don't, but I do. Boil. You can boil it. You can pressure cook it. Do you think it's a safe product? <laughs> Somebody says no. Pressure Why? Cooked, yeah. You bet pressure cook it. It's good. Pressure cooked lamb shanks. I'm coming to those here in a minute. Why do you say it's not safe? <laughs> you just don't want to eat it? If you don't want to eat it, that's a quality issue. Right? But that's the important point here. You don't want to taste it. It's not going to kill you. It's going to lick you back. Yeah. <laughs> right? got the taste buds, right? It does have yeah. the taste buds. It has the skin off of it. But it has the texture that carries through. It's just part of the beauty of this product. <laughs> Oh, so good. So what's the high risk part of this beast? Cilantro. The cilantro, right? <laughs> it's the lettuce. When in doubt, blame the lettuce. <laughs> More pictures from the kitchen this morning. <laughs> Do we have a quality or safety issue here? Quality. Yeah. <laughs> it is my counter after all. <laughs> it, could, it could be the counter's fault. You, you see, I have a stainless steel grade countertop. I'm hardcore. Doesn't mean I clean it, yeah. right? It's just like anything. If you don't actually take any action, kind of like some of the food industry, you can have all this, you know, fail, you know, all all the things in place to do things right. <laughs> Doesn't mean you did. You see, it's scratched. Each one of those are an opportunity for a biofilm. Don't eat at my house. <laughs> Unless we're pressure cooking. And we pressure cook lamb shanks, and they are good. Right? So what would you do to this peach? Who would throw this peach away? It's a, it's a pretty shady looking peach, right? You'd pitch it. And you'd throw it away because it's low quality or because you thought it was unsafe? Yeah, it's, it's safe. It's just crappy looking, OK? I mean, these molds, they're probably not, probably, they're not producing toxins in this case. They're more excited about eating the peach. Right? <laughs> Molds are better than us. And as Jeremy Lohman points out, mold are going to end us. They're going to eat us all. They're smarter than us. They're much more efficient at breaking down things like corn stalks. You know, we can't live on a corn stalk. Mold can. I mean, it's mean they're tougher than us. Ah, chicken. That's a spatchcocked chicken, if you needed a definition of how that chicken's been filleted open. So we took the backbone out of it so it cooks much more efficiently, which is good news, right? Because poultry is still the leading cause of salmonellosis in the United States. What about this juice right here? This sliminess. What is this? A bad weekend. <laughs> a bad weekend. <laughs> well, what if we cook it? Is it still a bad weekend? No, probably not. Now, if I put lettuce on this cutting board, is that a bad weekend? Yes. <laughs> That's a bad weekend. That's called if you don't want to go to work. Yeah. Give your lettuce a swipe on your cutting board, right? But we still have different, this chicken is going to cook differently depending on where, what part of the chicken we're looking at. If we go back to the thigh right here, which these are the legs kind of sticking through the thigh. It's kind of a scary situation for this chicken. He's not coming back from this, <laughs> but he's going to be tasty. <laughs> But you know, right in here is the deepest part of the muscle tissue where you actually need to be still thinking about putting your thermometer. It's not really in the chicken breast in this particular instance because of the configuration of this beautiful piece of meat. Now, if your chicken's super slimy, right, some of that could be the actual fluid running out of chicken. But when it starts to get really slimy, or you start to see those packages in the grocery store where there's some pressure on the overwrap, you know, they're kind of bubbled up. You've seen them. I hope that's not the one you bought. Because that's a quality. <laughs> you bought that one? <laughs> no. Or but, it stinks. <laughs> okay, so all of those 
are quality issues. When salmonella is growing on this product right here, oh no, oh no, there we go, I was near death. <laughs> When salmonella grows on this product, salmonella doesn't have a smell and it doesn't change the properties of that chicken at all. You could have a lethal dose, you could have one salmonella, you can't tell the difference. What was your question? What's your feeling on wood versus plastic versus glass cutting boards and will you dishwash with that plastic cutting board in the dishwasher? That's a great question. Um, wood cutting boards have no place anywhere. Um, because, well they have one over at the bar, <laughs> like by the wine like f only for f maybe like limes, maybe. <laughs> if my limes didn't die in the fruit bowl, because <laughs> they're usually half dead in the fruit bowl. Um, wood, by EPA definition, is not a cleanable or sanitizable surface. So it doesn't, you won't find it in food processing. So you'll find plastics, stainless steel, and you won't find much glass because we're worried about the physical hazard if it happens to break, All right? So if you've got wood, send it away. You can't clean it. And as soon as those, you know, as soon as your boards start to separate, think of the excitement that's in between the boards. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. You start looking. Yes. You saw my charcuterie board. What it come out on? A slab of wood. So the meat's probably safe. So yeah, the highest risk, actually, to your point, the highest risk thing on that situation is probably the board it was served on because you can't clean it and you can't sanitize it unless you put it in an autoclave. And everybody's got that handy. A sushi boat. Sushi boat, oh. I like sushi. But it has parasites. It does, I mean fish have parasites, the end. It's why you have to freeze sushi, or freeze fish in order for it to be sushi grade in the United States. You need to kill the parasites. Isn't that nice that they manage that for you? That's pretty good. Uh oh, he's showing me numbers. That's why I walked away from you, so I couldn't see them. <laughs> yeah, it's a high risk food. It's a really high risk food. Oh, well, the wood? Oh, the boat? Same. Same situation. Wood. Yep, anything that's wood is not a cleanable surface. The end. Wooden spoons. I have a lot of them, <laughs> but they usually go in hot things. But yeah, then you turn around and use it on a salad if it has splits or cracks or, you know, you actually gently stuck it in the blender and it chewed the end off. <laughs> you know you've got, you've seen it. <laughs> the garbage disposal took a bite out of it. I love this picture. It's actually a video, but we'll see. Oh, maybe? Yeah, no. Oh, yep. I don't remember where I got this. But you can hear me cackle in the background when I smack it, <laughs> right? Those tomatoes look pretty high quality. Well, they did <laughs> until the fruit flies start to completely degrade them. But they're excited about this one that's broken. Again, it's a wound. And so they have access to the content of the tomato. I'm just proud of my croaking bush. There's nothing wrong with this. I made it. It's perfect. <laughs> Except for I... <laughs> Except for I didn't have enough for the top and I was really mad. Because <laughs> this was about four rounds of um, patashu. And there's over 200, I think, uh, of those stupid cream puffs on there. And my fingers were really burned from putting it together. And then I ran out. So Barb suggested I top it with a bunch of bourbon shots, <laughs> which I think was a really nice, a nice you know, end to it. All right, what do we have here? Yeah, it's a good breakfast too. <laughs> it was, um, what was that? Uh, yeah, schwatzel. <laughs> Thank you. I was like, what is under there? Schwatzel's under there. What about these eggs? Are these legal? They are by the state Indiana code. As long as you can get this yolk to 145 degrees internal temperature and hold it there for 15 seconds, and it is possible. It's just really fun to do that experiment at home. It's like you're down on your knees with your thermometer, but it is possible. Is this a higher risk product? You bet. Does salmonella survive that temperature? I think it does in my lab. So if you're immunocompromised, don't eat that. We don't even need to talk about this. This is raw milk. You drink that, you're gonna die then. <laughs> this is me, in case you haven't figured that out. This is what our lab does. And this is what people think I do. This is what I really do. 
<laughs> I clean delis with my graduate students, and this is a deli case, right? And actually, this is another deli case. So this is the part of the deli case you don't see. And why do you shop in the deli? Because you think it's higher quality, right? You go have your meat sliced because you're excited about it. You're like, I would rather pay 10 bucks a pound for deli meat X that doesn't have any growth inhibitors in it i.e. microbial growth inhibitors. But this is what's sitting below in some of those cases. And this is the fan that circulates the air. Okay. So again, you keep living the dream in quality land. <laughs> some more lovely deli pictures. Do you eat raw cookie dough? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Educated risk, though. One in 20,000 eggs is, is predicted to have salmonella in it. So again, it's educated risk. Oh, this is a deli that we flooded, and the, 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 um, the sewer backed up, and we had about two inches of standing sludge in this deli at the end of the night. It was a good time. I don't think we improved the food safety of that. All right. I didn't get to Afghanistan, which is a bummer, but I can take questions about it. I have pictures in here that are pretty salty. I'll explain carbon cycling here if we need to in a minute. Um, but these pictures are about to get interesting. I do spend quite a bit of time in Afghanistan. I've been there 11 times. Now, this is poultry slaughter in Afghanistan. If you want to see what it looks like in the United States, you're trolling around. <laughs> Take a look at Frontline's Trouble with Chicken. That's a good insight into what poultry processing looks like in the United States. It doesn't look like this. This is what beef production looks like, um, often roadside slaughter. <laughs> Well, this is the reality of things. So you have, not to, well, just lay it out. These are heads in the corner. And uh, because this is halal slaughter, we do need the animals to be alive when they're processed, or right before processing. And this is how meat is actually sold. Obviously, it was similar to this in the United States at one point, but not really something you'd see roadside today. This is us doing training in Afghanistan, just proof we were there. We're trying to improve the skill sets of the Ministry of Public Health and, and the Ministry of Agriculture in order that they can start to improve the general baseline of food safety in Afghanistan. This is my fried lamb shank. Oh my gosh, you haven't lived. It's pressure cooked, then it's deep fried, and then you put some chutney on it, and the chutney's what kills you. Because <laughs> it's just blended up cilantro and walnuts, and it is a thing of beauty. You eat that on the last day when you're headed home. Yeah. And that is my policy. Yeah. At least you're going home. <laughs> so, challenges in Haiti. This is challenges in China. So if you've ever had mandarin oranges, I am gowned up like I'm ready for surgery. This is, oh, go back. You know, mandarin oranges that don't have any of the peel on them. This is all fine and good. You know, I am ready for surgery, except for I had to wrap my headscarf around my face when I went to the bathrooms because I was puking because of the smell. So food safety only goes so far. Do you think it's safe? I don't know. I, I just hope I've convinced you otherwise. This is how much you waste. Please start thinking about doing less of it and really think about what quality means. The organisms that cause disease don't change the actual visual appearance, smell, taste of your food. They just live in different worlds. So I did eat at the president's house. I said I'm not dead. I ate the shrimp. I did not eat the shrimp butts. These, my sister likes to eat the tails. I don't. The chutney was okay, but I left it alone. I like mine better. <laughs> Questions? I have lots of these. That's good. For, for some common products, right, like that. We're going to have people on the mic. Oh, okay. I'll oh. bring it back around. Go ahead. Oh. You, you were talking about most of the organisms that cause illness are in the, in the ground. What about um, home? production of fruits and vegetables then, either on the tree or if they hit the ground, or would you eat those? Oh, so there was a- Straight from the garden. Straight from the garden. Um, so the best thing you can do in this case is prevention. So you're gonna keep your dogs, or my dogs, because they're rogue, out of your products. You're gonna keep your cats out, you know, trying to keep wildlife away from it, bird droppings. All of these naturally occurring events are your food safety hazards. So there is a certain level of risk that's going to come with any product, whether it's produced locally or commercially. Um, 
it's not legal really by state code to sell a product that's hit like if it's a, an apple for it to actually be sold if it has touched the ground because of you know potential fecal contamination are they perfect no we've seen with like carameled apples um, and the listeriosis outbreak caused by those it, it's it's really hard to outrun some of these diseases uh, professor I'm running the, away uh, you were talking about quality is not have an organism. Food quality and food safety being different, and you mentioned milk and dairy products, and of course we've been looking at the produce. At what point does a decrease in quality become a decrease in safety? I mean, can is is fruit in theory safe until it's vinegar, and then you can eat vinegar? I mean, vinegar is good. You know, can milk go until it separates and turns to cheese? And, is there kind of a, a way to a relation? Yeah, so th there, there isn't like this magic point in time. But when we start to accelerate reduction in quality, so if we leave our milk out, like on the counter, you know, it's going to spoil quickly. So you're going to have a quality loss that's fast. When, when you see the intersection between food safety and quality is when you've stored products in an environment that will also support the growth of a pathogen. So quality destruction will happen no matter what, because those organisms are likely to grow at refrigeration temperature, for example. But you leave it out at room temperature, if there was one pathogen there you know, that somehow escaped processing or was post-processing contamination, then you've put it in an environment to allow it to grow. So then, yes, if you do see a massive quality defect, you have increased the potential for pathogen growth, and they can grow concurrently. Does that answer your question? I have two questions. So the first one is, how does, um, uh, I know that there was like a bluebell recall. Yeah. Uh, why, what caused that? Bad sanitation and bad management and bad choices. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's it. Okay. I mean, th so they had listeria contamination and they've had it in that plant for, we know, for uh, at least five years. Mm -hmm. And in the, uh, meeting in DC that I was at in June, um, FDA reported that they'd been testing bluebell ice cream that was sequestered from that, and they they took in 10,000 units of that ice cream. They'd made it through about 2,300 at the time, and 99.9% .9 were positive for Listeria monocytogenes. That is completely unheard of when it comes to food borne disease and contamination events. And what that says, if they would have done due diligence and tested one product once, they'd have probably found they had a problem. And then the second one. Oh. I threw poop at you. Thanks. <laughs> and the second one is, uh, is it possible for honey to go bad? And if so, why or why not? So could honey go bad? If you put it in an environment where it can actually take on water, so maybe a high, high moisture, high humidity environment, and it starts to condense, or it, it's in that environment, maybe. But um, you know, the risk with honey is usually infant botulism. So why we don't feed babies honey? There's botulinum spores that can be present, just a soil organism. Babies don't have the microflora to outcompete it, and so you'll get some paralysis and other ugly things from consumption of honey. Where's the mic? Where's the mic? Here you go. Oh, there we go. So when it comes to trying to get rid of salmonella, like you know, when you're eating food from your garden, what's the minimum level of washing that it takes to safely get it? I mean. Is rinsing with water sufficient? I wouldn't think it would yeah. be, but. Rinsing with water is, you can. To just spread it around? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't rinse your chicken. How about that? that we don't do I've that, right? That. But yeah, uh, because you're about to, especially if you're at my house, I have a deli sprayer hose in my sink, because I don't know, I like to take my work home. Um, <laughs> but, and no, you're just gonna aerosolize it and blast it everywhere. Well, with produce, it, it's, you know, there's plenty of studies that have demonstrated you can't wash off salmonella and you can't wash off E. coli. And there's other work here at Purdue that actually demonstrates it moves into the tissue. And there's been studies where if you've inoculated the flower of a tomato with E. coli, you'll actually find E. coli on the inside of the fruit. So we are chasing, you know, if we're truly chasing zero risk, we're never going to make it. We're not going to have any food left, which I'll make it for a few weeks. But <laughs> after that, I'm going to be needing a charcuterie board, <laughs> even if it's on a board. I don't know what you have. You have salmonella, I think. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Try 
try to get to everybody if we can here. Try to do them in the order I see them. I know you have a question. We'll make sure you get yours answered. So I heard a story on NPR, and now I want your opinion. Why is milk stored at the back of the grocery store? That's a great question. Why is it stored? <laughs> because they make you walk to it, <laughs> right? If you look at how a grocery store is merchandised, it's the expensive stuff on the outside loop, and that's actually where their higher margins are. So People yeah. Buy the cold chain theory. They put it in the back to maintain a cold chain. So it is more efficient. So I was talking with you know, so the new Meyer, for example, they have oh my gosh, what do they say? Half a million. In, in refrigeration units, like that's the initial investment. It's massive to actually install that stuff. And it is more efficient if they're daisy chained together. Now, they have also just, you know, just working with manufacturers of those cases, the bottom corner, wherever it isn't next to another case, so like the end cap, that's the warmest spot in that case. So don't get your milk from there. <laughs> all right, there's your takeaway. That's, all you, that's probably all you'll remember today. So you hinted at this in the early part of your talk when you uh, <laughs> said how much you love fermented foods. Uh, a lot of the protection that we get from the bad microorganisms <coughs> comes from some of the good microorganisms. The fact that we have so many microorganisms in our biome is sort of a, sort of, uh, a balance, right? Well, there is a balance to that, and it's why I have this wild fear of randomly taking antibiotics. Now you, there's a lot of diseases, especially foodborne, that it's actually higher risk to take an antibiotic because you're going to kill off your flora. And if that you know, foodborne illness that you have is antibiotic resistant to that particular drug that you just took, you've wiped out all of your good friends. Right? You took out your friends and you know, kind of cleared the stage for this opportunity for other microbes to grow. And so yeah, it's very important. And, and you know, eating yogurt or trying to repopulate you know, with some of those probiotic type organisms is important if you're gonna be on antibiotics. This is the common cold, I'm sorry. It's winter, <laughs> winter's coming. <laughs> winter's coming. Um, I was thinking about uh, li all the listeria recalls. You had ice cream and frozen vegetables, cut fruit, lettuce, um, and then as a pregnant woman we're told not to eat deli meat, yeah. and that's where they draw the line. So I was just, to me, I kind of just try not, I avoid it, but I feel like it, there's, there's risk with pretty much any food group at this point. What is your opinion on that? I think you've, you've really hit on a very important point. Yeah, <laughs> you can get listeriosis from about anything these days. You're down to Rice Krispies. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> make sure you make Rice Krispie bars, because at least those are good. Um, but no, that we, we're, we're with these new outbreaks and with the recalls that come with them, we're redefining the high-risk foods. There hasn't been a listeriosis outbreak or recall associated with deli meat since 2003. It is still an excellent practice. And if you want to eat deli meats and you're pregnant, just heat them up. Right? I mean, it might get a little rubbery, but, but I mean, that's how you manage your risk and, and buy prepackaged. So those packages, especially the soft ones, I think a lot of Hormel products, for example, are high pressure processed. So their deli meat goes in the package and then it's processed that goes through a process that actually explodes the listeria, which is just cool at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, it's high risk. If you want to really manage your risk, cook your food. <coughs> We got a time typhoid. typhoid. One All more. right, watch your heads, everyone. You might get hit with typhoid fever. <laughs> Why do we still exist? Why do we still exist? Because I'm tough as nails. <laughs> well, evolution at its finest, right? I don't know how else to put it. Right? We're the survivors. Low dose, long term is actually kind of something I live by. So. <laughs> Educated risk, low dose long term, it's not a plan for everyone, right? But it is kind of how I think about it. If we ate, if we ate a sterile food supply, we wouldn't have exposure and we wouldn't be prepared for that day when we did interface with it. So I've got a question. Uh, you often hear something about like ceviche being cooked by the lime juice. Um, yeah. it, it seems like it would denature the protein in the fish, but I don't know what it would do with the microbes. It's a great question. I was wondering if you could comment. Yeah, no, that's exactly what's happening. It turns that weird gray pasty color. 
that it does when it's exposed to lime juice because yeah, it's just denaturing the proteins of the fish or the scallops or whatever you have in the mix. Um, you are taking a risk. You're hoping that the organism that is there probably can actually be killed or denatured or that cell wall ruined by the presence of that much acid. Pretty good chance that it's going to work. But as the protein you know, is denatured, and protein will, will buffer that system, so the pH may not be as low as you think, given the amount of acid that you added to it. So is it high risk? Yeah. Is it good? Yeah. <laughs> I guess for that reason, though, because I was always afraid that it wouldn't get rid of the microbe. It, I wouldn't use it as a control strategy. Risk is still there. You want MRSA? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> Who doesn't? Who's left? Botulism. Oh man, the boss is asking a question. <laughs> not asking a question. It just at least we all think that why are we all here still? Just in the U.S., we've got 330 million people eating three times a day. So that's a billion meals a day, a billion opportunities for for pathogenesis to happen. Plus all the times you put your fingers in your nose, your eyes, your mouth. I mean, there's probably a trillion times a day that people could get sick. Yeah. Yet we've got less than 2,000. Instances of one, uh, the stereomycetogenes, you know, I and mean, we're in the in the quadrillions of opportunities. So, from our from the food perspective, we are incredibly safe. Yeah, it's phenomenal yeah. how plentiful and, and safe our food is, and it's because of people like Doc Oliver and yeah, that others, guy's pretty important um, too. Working on it. Brian Farkas, <laughs> department head of food science, by the way, <laughs> he knows a thing or two. I'll say that while he's here. <laughs> no, it is important. We have one of the safest, I, I think, no thinking, we have the safest food supply in the world. And the safer we make it, the less exposure we have. So it, it's a fine line, honestly, my opinion. Eat your oysters, one. I hate one. to say, but we are out of time. We have to make uh, time for the next guest to prepare. So um, I'd like to thank Dr. Oliver, if everybody could give her a big hand.